Your creativity, your consciousness, your invention, inventiveness, your energy, your life force is now going into the service of what? It's going into service of profit. That's the motive that you're being paid for. You contribute to this artificial entity, entity called a corporation. They hire you. Now they own your life force and they own your creativity and they direct it toward a profit, not toward making the commons a better place for all human beings, not for making the earth a better place, not for making uh, the activities of human beings net positive to the earth, none of those things. Hey, Stephen, how are you doing today? Oh, doing great, thanks. How are you doing, Ben? I'm doing all right. Thanks for okay. meeting me today. I uh, appreciate you taking the time to to sit down, do a podcast, and get into the world of, of seeds, hypha, whatever we get into today. Um, I've been wanting to do this for a while, and it's uh, I think it's needed. I think bringing some life and some activity into the community um, is always needed. You know, a lot of the people watching this are going to be um familiar with seeds and the journey and and haifa um maybe some not so if we get into a brief summary of of how we got to the point now we're four years in and it isn't working as as great as what a lot of people what we what the vision first held for us and i think a lot of us still have that that seed in our heart and that flame in our our mind and our ideas and i want to rekindle that a little bit but what holds that is uh, the ro the rocks around the fire. And so there's some foundational issues maybe we've missed along the way. And maybe we can identify some of those key, so those key points if you're, if you're up for it. What do you think? I'm very up for it. And I think it's a very valuable conversation. I'm very embedded in seeds right now and pretty dedicated to moving seeds forward into the next level of our great experiment. And a great experiment it is. And so what is your, so what brought you into seeds? And, and um, I mean, you're kind of in from the beginning, right? Or just. Yeah, I, I was uh, early on. I wasn't at the very beginning. Uh, those guys were uh, all based in Bali and uh, New York and N New Zealand and so forth. But I knew most of them and I eventually was involved with most of them. Uh, I was involved starting in 2020, uh, right around May, April, May 2020. And of course, it had a history going all the way back when it first got mentioned in 2017 uh, as an idea. And then it went through a gestation period. Uh, but when it was first actually implemented was in 2019, just before I got on board. What was it that caught your interest? So the, the vision for me, and this is, of course, my interpretation of it, and I've had many conversations with many of the original founders of it. This came originally from the rights of nature movement in New Zealand and people talking to, at festivals about what really needed to be done uh, to move in the world in an entirely different direction. And it was very, very clear that part of the problem was fiat currency itself. It wasn't just the willingness of human beings to recognize a regenerative future, but it was the difficulty of using a currency that has embedded within it the very seeds of our own uh, destruction, which basically is a currency based upon old, old, decades old, millennia old ideas of the dominance of human beings over nature. Uh, the uh, idea that scarcity is inherent in anything to do with wealth and money, and that competition was essential for uh, a good system to work. All those are actually false. And they are embedded in the very nature of our currency system, which ultimately leads to what we have today, which is a world 
in which we are based on extraction. We actually can, we know we have the technology to be, for human beings to net, be net positive to the earth. And we are, in fact, the only creature on the earth that is not net positive to the earth. Uh, a famous uh, study was done by the chairman of the board and founder of, of Buckminster Fuller Institute, uh, Tom Chi, in which he measured the weight of all the ants in the world and did the calculation. And then it turns out that that's 350 million tons. And of then, ants. Of ants. Yeah. And, and it turns out, though, when you measure the weight of all the human beings on the planet, it's also 350 million tons. Okay. And ants eat something like 10 times their weight every day in food. And human beings eat somewhere around 2 to 5% of the weight every day in food. And yet ants, even though they're eating 10 times their weight, so if they weigh 350 million tons, they're, e they're eating uh, 3 billion, 500 million tons of food every day, they're still net positive to the earth. Human beings, mm -hmm. on the other hand, even though we're eating a fraction of that, we're not net positive. We're the only uh, creature on the planet that is not net positive to the ecology within which we live. So and can we you... Know would you mind? Okay. So what do you mean by net positive? So how does that contribution or like, can you like the definition of regeneration? I know some people have said, well, what is, what does regenerative mean? It kind of became one of those buzzwords that lost its value before people even knew what it meant. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. Any kind of buzzword it becomes quickly a fad. Um, and right now the current fad is using the word regeneration. No, instead of sustainable. So we're graduating from sustainable, which is not enough. We need to be regenerational, and it gets closer to what it means to be net positive. So every single species, you can take a look at how they operate in their particular ecological niche. They actually add, uh, you take their, their use of, of uh, the resources of the earth, and their contributions outweigh their use of the resources. That's what it means to be net positive. So in terms of the earth itself and the ecology, deer are net positive to the earth. Uh, bear are net positive to the earth. Fish are net positive to their environment. Ants are net positive to the environment. They, they contribute more to the ecology than they take out of the ecology. Well, the only exception is human beings. And that's simply because we haven't had the will. We have the knowledge. We have the ability. We have everything it takes to be net positive. We don't have the will, and we still don't have the will. Because the system that we have chosen to live by, which captures the inherent energy of all human beings, is not a net positive focused system. So think about it this way. What are the most precious things that any human being has? It's their time and their energy. The system that we have, oh, one other aspect of it is every human being is unique in their ability to make a contribution. Their particular skill set, which is like a snowflake, is different than every other human being. And no matter whether you're an Einstein or somebody moving a rock from one place to another, everybody has their contributions they can make. We have a system that doesn't allow that to happen. Another way to think about it is when I'm talking to my students when, uh, as an MBA professor, uh, I would happen to be teaching in Kuwait when they got the women got the vote. And I was there right on the day that it passed for the first time. And that was like just a few years ago. Um, so I, con I congratulated the men first and not the women. W why is that? Because intellectual ability, IQ, is distributed equally between men and women around the world. And if you don't allow your women to participate in the economy and to participate in 
decisions and production and and creativity, you have actually tied your hands behind your back and made your particular society less able to allow the contributions of those women because of your uh, particular social norms. So that's what happens. It extrapolate that to the world. We live in a world where there's inequality, access to wealth, there's uh, inequality of income. And so that disenfranchises billions of people from being able to contribute the way they could. There might be an Einstein in the middle of a village in Africa somewhere, and they just never are able to develop that. And they never ever, they were never able to bring that gift to the world. That's one of the things that the grand experiment of seeds specifically wanted to address. How's that? So we, yeah. yeah. How is that? Because we want to create a system that we, you receive payment for doing what you loved and doing what you wanted to contribute to and you elected to do that rather than a system in which, uh, like we have now, I call it predatory capitalism. It's not even classic capitalism anymore. It's a form of sort of eroded capitalism that now has become predatory capitalism. And in this system, you, no matter how much you invest in yourself and your own education, when you go to work, this happened to me personally, when you go to work for a large corporation, the first thing you have to do is sign away your rights to anything that you create. They own it. Just because they're paying you, they own it. And they can go trade it off to China or anywhere they want. Even though you invented it while you work for them. Not only that, the bigger thing is that your creativity, your consciousness, your invention, inventiveness, your energy, your life force is now going into the service of what? It's going into service of profit. That's the motive that you're being paid for. You contribute to this artificial entity entity called a corporation. They hire you. Now they own your life force and they own your creativity and they direct it toward a profit, not toward making the commons a better place for all human beings, not for making the earth a better place, not for making uh, the activities of human beings net positive to the earth, none of those things. Not only that, The the main ingredients of life are water and air, and we're degrading those things. It's when you really think about it as in a logical way, why would human beings create a system that destroys the very thing that created life? Why it's on that surface of that argument, it's it's clear that we should not do that for our own our own survival. But that yet that's what we have. So the seeds created a system to to give human beings an option to do it a different way, a brand new different way. It's a it's a gigantic experiment, a gigantic uh, lift. And we knew when we started it that it was a lifelong enterprise, not not you know something you do in two years or four years or ten years. It's it's a dedicated life time thing. And not everybody can do that. But those of us that can, we're going to make a difference in just by creating a model and making an option so human beings can see that here is another way of doing it. Here it is. It works. And that was the goal of seed. So we, but we started with the money. We did actually literally start with the money with creating an earth friendly cryptocurrency that was designed to be global in nature, to be available on both the Android and the iOS platform, which we did. And we became very successful very quickly and with 11,500 wallet holders in 85 countries. Yeah, I wrote, I wrote down how to measure and manage quality, you know, because we've been measuring and managing quantity. Gross GDP determines how good we are as a collective, as a, right, as as a as a as a, con- a country. You know, what's yeah. our gross? What's what's my end of? How much product am I producing? What's you know, it, you know, w- w- I realized quickly personally 
I learned how to manage and grow resources. But what I found is I didn't have time with my family. And when my mom was close to 70, she was spending all of her time, even though she was still running a business, she spent all of her time, well, a lot of her time. She made sure she always had what we called forced family fun, you know, because <laughs> she would make sure everybody came around. And now early in early days in our family, we didn't have that. You know, we were she was busy, busy, busy. Her and my stepdad were creating companies. And I think a lot of us get caught in that grind. And we we know if we're doing well, basically because we can eat we can eat a little bit out maybe with, you know, some friends and have a little bit of time to ourselves. But if you're recreating the structure of social norms, so to say, and measuring quality and managing quality outcomes, and now also blockchain is the foundational structure to do that, how does that happen? And, and now it's, we're four years down, so I'd love to get into what expectations weren't met because, you know, you said this is a lifelong deal and, it was, you know, some things were anticipated, but what was expected, not anticipated? How didn't it work, you know, and, and how can we really measure what, what quality we need for function, for co- what quality measurements and management we need and to actually move in a distributed authority or a decentralized governance model? How does that happen? So when you look at that question, it has three basic areas to discuss. One is the technology two is the seeds community movement, and three is the Haifa platform that we were operating under. But let me just start with the seeds community. Specifically within the seeds community, our tokenomics design was flawed. And we didn't know that at the time. We, uh, we did the very best that we knew how to do. And human beings were not aware of what we are now aware of even four years later. So in our system, we had built into it an era, an area of speculation so that people with their seeds were anticipating that one of the, one of the motivations for having seeds was still accumulation of seeds because it could have value and make you wealthier. We inadvertently put that in by having a system where every uh, period of time, it would go up by a, another fraction of a percent or another percentage. And we and that kept going for quite a while. So we watched it march up for from one cent to two cents to three cents to four cents, all the way up to nine and a half cents, 10 cents. Uh, that system worked, but it was, it had inherent within it a problem. It had speculation built into it. It didn't start with value creation at the grassroots level, it started with value creation in the model from the top down. That was an error. Um, and we know it now. And we know it for lots of different reasons. Another era, error that we made was thinking that we could start putting the seeds out there. We, we issued 3.14 billion seeds. And we have a total uh, right now of seeds accounts on the blockchain i think there's 17 of them these each of those seeds account are not controlled by any individual they're controlled by smart contracts the smart contracts in the early days these smart contracts used to be written so that once you wrote, wrote them they could not be uh, changed or interfered with by any means whatsoever they were locked in the problem with that was if you made a mistake in your coding, you couldn't really go back and correct it. Or if you made a mistake how it worked, you couldn't go back and correct it. So then the next idea was to come up with the idea of a system of multi-signatories. So you would have anywhere from three to five trusted individuals who could go in and modify the authorize the modification of the smart contract. But you'd have to have three out of five. So the idea there was that uh, you would minimize theft and other bad actors from acting in ways that are not uh, supportive of the community at large and the values of the movement. So that's what we have in seeds. We have that system. But we 
we could, became so popular that it ran away with us. So people actually started really believing that they could use seeds as an alternate to fiat currency. They could use it to live, to put their food on the table, uh, to put a roof over their head, and to do all those things. They, they really ran away with the dream, and they started selling those seeds for fiat way at, at such a large volume way before we were ready for what we then in that model called go live. And that by itself, that, that was a problem of success because so many people were doing that, it drove the price down. It drove it down below a penny again. And and that and when you did that, the whole system, people lost faith in the system because they were prematurely relying on it to put food on the table, and it didn't do that. So they, they many people absolutely had to put food on the table. And so they couldn't use seeds the way they were trying to use it. And, it, and why not? Can you, can you pinpoint like one, one, is there any specific thing to point at that could have been changed or focused on at that point? Uh, it's a little complicated. So what we're doing now is we're rewriting the tokenomics. And we've hired one of the top uh, professionals in the world who is a tokenomics architect, uh, Darren Swords in the UK, to rewrite our tokenomics starting from scratch. And so one of the things that that he determined right away is you can't take one coin and make it do all the jobs that you need to have it do. Uh, so we now, in the new tokenomics design, which, by the way, the white paper is supposed to be ready next week. And that's after almost eight months of work. So that will call for two different kinds of seeds tokens. One is re he's referring to for now as, as the governance token, which is really more of a, a, a kind of a voice token. And the other one is sort of a market token. So you separate those two. And we haven't, I haven't seen the white paper, but we're looking forward in the seeds economic circle where we will receive the first draft of it and that's where the deep discussions will begin. But to answer your question, where do we make the mistake? Well, there were a number of them. The first one was we did not anticipate how popular this would get and how fast it would develop and how we would lose control of the ability to, to stop people from trying to uh, trade it prematurely before we even had it on any exchange, before we even had any method of liquidity pool to guarantee and hold the value. And more importantly, we didn't build value uh, into the coin at the grassroots level. So the new tokenomics that we're going to come up with will start with grabbing value at the village level, at the grassroots level. And we will connected in such a way with DAOs around the world that have their own tokens that will be able to exchange in some form or another. The tokens that they have, like in Finca Sagrada, for example, that farm in Ecuador, they have their own token. And as they create value in their local region, that value will eventually be exchangeable with the seeds token, which will eventually, eventually uh, be exchangeable in some manner or another with the outside uh, world of fiat currency. Keep in mind that we live in a dominant world of fiat currency, and it's not going to end anytime soon. It might end by simply uh, having a catastrophic financial breakdown, which we avoided with the Bretton Woods Agreement in 1944, and we're now at another place where there's severe pressures on the current fiat system coming everywhere from Russia, from China, from the wars around the world. Right now, the dominant fiat currency is still uh, the euro and the dollar. The dollar is the world reserve currency. It's still used primarily for oil and uh, diamonds and other pricing transactions. But oil, well, we all know, we can see, burning fossil fuels is going to come to an end in the next 20 years. 
And that means we won't need the world uh, dominant currency for exchange of oil. So whatever is going to happen, we know in the next 20 years, that dominant system is going to change radically. So we're living in a, a period of tremendous flux and uncertainty. It's, it's a time, flux and uncertainty uh, is difficult for human beings to handle. For one thing, they, they, uh, the, most economic systems require stability and certainty. But change thrives when there's uncertainty because that's when people open their minds to new solutions. So change is something that, that occurs best when we enter in, into periods of chaos and turmoil which we're heading in now, we're in it, and we're gonna to continue to be in it. And the longer human beings are unable to find a, a more regenerative solution for human activities on the planet, the, the more suffering we will have as a, as a species. Yeah, and so you think the tokenomics model that's being worked on right now is something that is, is showing pretty good light to to show the way through this you know like what gives you hope now are we at a point to where we can use it or are we at a point where some of the problems before because you know, there were I, I believe there were other problems from my experience um communication and some basic governance stuff um and haifa went more into the governance model as a as a profit you know, for-profit model to, to be sustainable, but because there's a lot of need and I saw it directly, but so like right now with the financial, the tokenomic concerns, um, the run on the seeds where people just sold them, you know, we need to avoid some of these things. There's been a lot of thought. There's been a lot of energy put in by some amazing individuals volunteering their time even. So there's something that we all believe in. Um, so now what gives you hope? Um, now, so you're still in it. A lot of people, there's over 10,000 people that downloaded the app, believed in the idea, believed in the technology, believed in the people putting it together. Now, where are we at? And where do you see us going like in the near future? Well, okay, so let me tell you some areas of hope. I mean, I'll give you some areas of hope in this system. It's, it's still a long journey ahead of us because it's a very big thing that we're trying to do. But here's some areas of hope. Uh, for one, the Seeds community had agreed to transfer what we call the 79 million milestone seeds to the Haifa, to the uh, Seeds Collaboratory DAO. Mm -hmm. So those 79 million seeds are sitting in an account that cannot be readily moved from that account to the Seeds Collaboratory account without having the proper underpinnings necessary. Those underpinnings are being done as we speak. So we now have a Seeds Collaboratory account to receive those seeds. And we are just publishing a paper this week to go into staging in the Seeds Collaboratory DAO. We just went over it yesterday and Chuck uh, Harrison is going to place it into staging this week. That paper will outline the policy for transferring those 79 million seeds. Roughly, what will we do with those 79 million seeds? We will take them, and these, these are so-called legacy seeds. This is not the new Seeds 2.0. These are legacy seeds. So one of the issues that has to be dealt with with this new Seeds 2.0 white paper is not to relegate the old legacy seeds to uselessness. We can't do that. We have to figure an answer out to that. And there's, there's roughly one billion of those seeds out there in the world, whether they're in uh, alliances and campaigns. Uh, there's so-called 175 million of uh, free uh, tradable seeds, and then there's also uh, another large group of seeds that are locked seeds. 
and those will remain locked for now. But the ones that are uh, open and tradable, we have to figure out how to use those. But anyway, getting back to the 79 million seeds, that will come directly into the treasury function of the seeds collaboratory DAO. We have a multi-sig already to handle it. Uh, we have a lot of the pieces to handle it. What we have just are posting now to the staging for discussion is how to, uh, what to do with those 79 million seeds. And we came up with a basically roughly this outline to, for the seeds uh, members to consider. 30% uh, will go to those volunteers who were not paid for the last nearly two years for all the work they did. 30% uh, will go to uh, work on the critical infrastructure that needs to be uh, paid uh, in the future for future work for the seeds movement. And 40% will go toward developers, programmers, etc., to update the seeds light wallet and the smart contracts and even update the HYPA platform so that stays current and grows with the community at large. And those people all need to be paid ultimately one way or another in um, fiat. So that means 40% could be sold for fiat for what we can get. And we know right now there's still enough of a market for seeds. We could at least get somewhere around a cent each. If you take the whole 79 million seeds, if we were to sell all 790 mil, uh, 790, uh, 79 million seeds, that would be $790,000. We don't know how that's going to work, but that's what's going to be this week posted into staging. So we, we will have that. Here's another area of hope. One of the mistakes that we made with the early on with seeds is we thought we could do everything with seeds. We didn't need any fiat at all. That was a big mistake. We live in a fiat world. You can't live in a fiat world alone uh, without having some, uh, uh, you can't create a seeds world that's separate and parallel to the to the fiat world without having a link between them. The question is what link will work and what link won't. So uh, several of us got together and we realized that we need to have a 501c3 dedicated seeds connection where we can take fiat currency, put it in there and have the seeds collaboratory distribute that to the people that are doing the work that need fiat. And just to give you, we, we are setting that up. We're, we're on the verge of setting it up now. So basically what happened is Cascadia Bioregion in the Northwest, which is runs from Southern Alaska to the middle of Oregon. It's one of the largest bioregions. Their 501c3 is called Department of Bioregions. They have a very settled program for doing what's called fiscal sponsorship. They can take somebody like a, a, a seeds, which is, not currently within any legal jurisdiction and still work with it and create uh, an ability to spend uh, so, so that we can generate fiat and spend fiat directly without going through seeds or anything else. So we're doing that. That's going to happen in the near future. Um, we, we have been able to, to set this up in such a way that we see that there's a lot of synergy possible between the bioregions and seeds. And seeds originated with people from the bioregions and the rights to nature movement. I want to say one more thing about that. Um, when you look at bioregions, you realize that this is the Earth's way of telling human beings, how do you live regenerationally on this planet? The Earth is already telling us how to do it. It already has the plan to do it. How do we know that? Cascadia looked at that, and they mapped all the watersheds on a computer throughout their whole bioregion. Then, then out of curiosity, they, map, 
the major language groups of the indigenous people. Now, the indigenous people of this region have been here for 12,000 years. So how did their language groups associate with the watersheds? It turns out there's basically a direct relationship. The major language groups of the indigenous people grew up and accomplished them and then created their, their areas directly related to how they... Uh, uh, weaves together with nature in the watersheds. So the the groups uh, that were in one water, major watershed had their own language, but they lived a lifestyle that was very consistent and net positive to nature of the watershed they were living in. We, we learned from that that nature has already given us the key. It's the watersheds. <clears throat> so we're in the midst of forming uh, another piece of hopeful news, we are in the midst of forming a relationship with Gaia Union. Gaia Union is led and founded by Felipe Leal, and they have been working for a good 10 years to develop bioregional networks around the world. Hey, real quick, let me pause you on Gaia real quick because yeah. I was looking on YouTube and I don't know if it was Felipe or somebody else in the Spanish speaking world, but there's a uh, there's a whole list of relevant videos. Somebody created a playlist and most of them are in Spanish. So if there's anybody watching this podcast right now that wants a crash course or uh, a seeds and regenerative cryptocurrency uh binge watching session there's a whole it's a great play, playlist a lot of uh, old and recent videos so i just wanted to drop that in there since you were talking about guy union um it, it was a, yes. it was great find somebody i don't remember who put it together but somebody put together several videos that so if anybody wants a good resource with several videos on youtube um you may be able to search gaia union if you search seeds enough you'll see that there is a playlist of several videos yeah, it's, but, it's Gaia-Union is the website. Mm -hmm. They're primary, but they have other websites, and they are the source of those of those videos. And they do have it in English, too, but most because they started in Spanish-speaking countries, and most of them are in Spanish. But what I wanted to say is people around the world have been listening to those videos and watching those videos and getting informed for, uh, as as understanding how nature is speaking to us. And and then recently, very large donors got together in Switzerland and decided to make a very large donation to them. And I mean, I'm not going to go into the specifics, but it's quite large and significantly large. That's awesome. And they, in turn, are going to make a large donation to SEEDS uh, and Fantastic. specifically to this nonprofit relationship that we're setting up with Cascadia. Uh, they're, they're, they're discussing with us about a million dollar donation. So uh, that's scheduled for April of this year. So that's, that's another, exciting news. Yeah. Yeah. That's another now, piece of hope. <laughs> yeah. And now though, it's uh, an image of, 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 of th throwing water <laughs> on the ground without a channel for it to flow in. And so I, yeah. I go back to the structure and the, the function for the flow now, and that like with the tokenomics and the governance. And so are we there yet, Stephen? Have we locked it down enough to where we can like bring back the original vision? And I love, I love that. And I think anybody watching this who hasn't seen some of the original videos that Raggy put together, he has such a way of um, embodying the vision of that more beautiful world, you know? Yeah. And, and, and I want to, I love to go back there because it's easy for us to get in the minutia, but are yeah. we close to that point? So we've, we've figured a lot out and can we make a new video of where we bring that hope alive again soon? Kind of like what, share with me some of you know like can you give me a timeline you think or what what kind of certainty or like where does your hope really find its foundation right now okay so yeah that's a deep question actually <laughs> uh, yes so my own personal faith is the fact that all human beings are connected we're, we're connected as in the lakota tradition 
Uh, I have a Lakota name. I studied with the medicine men there, Sam Moose Camp, uh, for years, went to the Sundance, and I learned the ways of the indigenous people, the Lakota people. And they say to each other, me, you, all created things are one. It's the same thing in the nonprofit I started called Kinship Earth. We're all kins with each other. So from that stems my faith and my my trust. And I trust that the cosmic impulse that connects us all with all life is leading us. Whether we know it or not, whether we can see the progress or not, it still is. And in the case of where we're going now, we we have a a major progress ready to sprout in 2024. Uh, and I and I believe it will happen. So but at the same time, one of my mentors was, uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of Satir, Virginia Satir. Have you ever heard that name? No, I haven't. Vir Virginia Satir is the mother of family therapy. She created the, the phrase family therapy. She was the very first family therapist. And she was a personal friend of mine, and I was on her board for 20 years. And she had something called Satir Family Camp and many other. You can go find the global Satir uh, programs and people that learned her system. And essentially, what, what she taught us is that human beings are essentially meaning-making machines. That's what she, she taught us. Every single human being perceives things and, and then makes a meaning. It doesn't matter what I intend for you to understand from my words. You're going to understand something else, and you're going to make your own meaning out of it. So therefore, human beings have a great deal of difficulty coming to consensus about anything. And when you take the environment that we're working in now, which is a virtual world that we're working in right now, like even this minute, you and I are working virtually. We're not in front of each other. We know that face-to-face -face you can establish consensus way faster than you can in a, in a virtual world. We're working in a virtual community within the seeds community that has issues and problems all of its own that are unique, even separate from what happens with human beings trying to do something face-to-face. -face. So developing how you build trust in that kind of environment is even more difficult not not less difficult, more difficult. So part of the problems and issues facing anyone doing what the SEEDS movement is trying to do is how to establish that trust. One of the ways we're doing it is by using platforms like the Haifa open source DAO platform. DAOs are uh, virtual organizations. They're called distributed autonomous organizations. SEEDS runs within a distributed autonomous organization. Human beings are only just getting to put their toe in the water of what that really means, how it works, what are the rules, how do you have uh, positive, constructive ways of doing that. So when you look in the United States, there are now only two states that allow you to have a, a legal venue of a DAO to legally be licensed as a DAO. One of them is Wyoming. The newest one is Utah. And Utah, by most people's sense, has the best uh, current statutes for uh, having a DAO legally licensed in their state, and which then gives you the ability to actually open up a checking account, for example. Uh, our DAO, our seeds DAO, still does not have a home. We are, we are not anywhere. We're not in Liechtenstein, which has its own venue, legal venue. We're not in the Seychelles. There's other countries doing it. We, we, we need to find that legal venue. That's one of the steps that has to happen in 2024. And we will. We'll, we'll, we'll decide where to have it because we need to protect our members in, in this world that we live in. And the way the current governance by different countries is looking at these DAOs and, and the crypto world. They're all deciding it's in flux and how they're going to regulate that.
What we do know is that digital currency is the wave of the future. It's going to happen. And we want seeds to be part of the options that are out there. Even the dollar will go digital. Euro will go digital. They'll all go digital. It only makes sense. And it makes sense for many, many solid economic re uh, reasons. But when you look at the challenge for anybody like the seeds movement, right now we've been operating for the most part in the last two years only with volunteers. We've had no way to pay them, no way to honor their contribution, and you can't run an organization like that. I mean, eventually it runs out of steam. People just don't have that much volunteer time. They gotta, they gotta keep a roof over their heads and food on the table and feed the children. Unless they're retired or have access or independently wealthy. So we want this to be carried forward with the young people. And to do that, we have to find a way to get support on a, on a fiat currency basis. So our plan is once we have our account set up with Cascadia, we're going to go out to the to the newsletter and send out an appeal. And the, we have 4,000 people receiving that newsletter. If everybody gives $5 uh, for one year, $5 per month for one year, you can do the math. If some people give up to $25, you can do the math. That will be all we need and then some to carry us forward successfully. And we only need to do it for one year. So that's what we're going to be. That's one of the plans. Yeah. So, the, and then will that be basically the treasury that will support um, the distribute the distribution of tokens and the the, the backing, so to say? Um, you know, I, we were speaking the other day about the um, the seeds or the different coins that are linked to the dollar and, and backed by a treasury, and so there's got to be some some growth. Um, restrictive and some crash bolstering mechanisms there um, are is all that complicated economics that I cannot even like barely understand uh, is that math secure <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so that so if there's speculation without active market you know where everybody's future casting and then banking and then flattening yeah. like that was a, that we don't want to do that again right <laughs> no we do not we want to drive speculation and accumulation of wealth completely out of the seed system so we think that now new I want seeds... to talk to you about that though specifically <laughs> because I, you can't drive speculation out of the system because we will always speculate on what tomorrow holds we should believe in tomorrow now, should that take us out of our uh, shoes? You know, should that take us yeah. out of our house to 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 put everything in? You know, like how does it work? Because right now I'm buying layer two coins because I believe that it's going to be the um, the the stock and currency of companies. And once we can collaborate cross change cross chain exchanges, easy, seamlessly, cheap free or pay me to do it it's going to happen soon and i am speculating and it should be you know i speculated in seeds because i believe in it maybe somebody's going to speculate in me and i'll do a gofundme and it should be it should there should be some uh some credit worthiness established to hedge your bets against you know what previous evidence of success or what structural securities are in place what people are involved that give me reason to bet on you. We want, I want people to bet on seeds. And so if that level of healthy aspect, this is, you know, not Well, we may be like talking about semantics. We might be talking about semantics here a bit. Okay. Um, so this, the money, this, the fiat capital that would come into the Cascadia by original uh, account for seeds would only be spent by uh, votes of the seeds collaboratory DAO members. So there's no nobody will have the ability to spend a penny from there unless it's approved by the seeds collaboratory DAO members. So, and to the extent you trust those people to do the right thing with that money, uh, that's 
part of how we intend to do that. When when you look at uh, well, is it is it a level of trusting people or or contracts? You know, I, that's that's one thing. Yeah, I believe in people, but I learned one thing from some wise business people. Yeah, and, and that's it doesn't exist unless it's in writing. So whether it be like only spend, only receive it at this value, or only sell it at this value, or yeah. trust these people that are managing the treasury. You know how so how are we how are we really doing that to where so, it's I trust mean, I less think that's, or minimize? That's a that's a good accurate rule, and and in the seeds collaboratory DAO, there everything is in writing. So it, it no decisions made that's not in writing. So. To so that extent, is true, but keep does in that mind, slow I, things down? I, though the decision making does it slow it, it does down? Slow, it does slow things down, but keep in mind. I mean, I know it's it, people tell you that you make sure you get in writing, but here's what I know: I've played with the big boys for many, many years. You know how the big boys play that game? They don't care if it's in writing. If they want it, they're going to steal it or take it or whatever, and then worry about the results later. Um, and that's you know, I don't. They don't care if it's in writing. You know, it doesn't matter. They're going to do what they want to do. And a lot of bigger operators, that's how they operate in reality. Um, so writing doesn't give you the the assurance that you think it does. But in terms of where we go with our seeds tokenomics, that will be in contracts. That's going to be in smart chain. That means smart contracts. That will not be able to be manipulated. But will we get it right even in the second time? There's probably going to be a third time, a fourth time, a fifth time. If you look at the current to tokens that are out there, first generation was Bitcoin. We already we all know that Bitcoin is not sustainable at its current energy usage rate. It's a, it's a great idea and it, it can hold its value because it's self-limiting in terms of they're not creating any new. Well, they're they're not. There's a limit on how many Bitcoin will eventually emerge. So by that alone, it becomes scarce. But so the that, electrical consumption for the computational power to manage the network will still be there, right? Mining will still exist, or is that not? Well, they're trying to come up with a system that does not use mining because if you look at the extrapolation of the use of energy to keep Bitcoin going with that system. It's 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 more than countries. Oh yeah, so, I had a I had a, a roommate. I lived on a, um, a farming community, a permaculture community, and one of the guys yeah. was a, a Bitcoin miner, and he put yeah. up, he got a whole um, what is it a level of three three something three phase electric. He wired yeah. that out to a shed. He put all these fans and servers in this shed. Yeah. And he had over three thousand dollars of electricity just buzzing this thing. All and I hate yeah. it because there I was so it was like across from the back porch from me when I go out yeah. in the morning and enjoy the sunrise. And this yeah. machine is running air conditioners just brah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, no, this can't yeah. be the way of the future. And, then, uh, and, and another thing about well we could get into that, but like, so yeah. the coins have their limitations, but as far as where we're going uh, and and how we can secure growth in a small community with a new coin or new yes. coins, um, very novel coins that need their own treasuries, they need their structure to grow if yes. people believe in them. They need their structure, the, the ability to dissolve, dissolve or move in an agile way as healthy as possible given market and social fluctuations yes that's a lot of like math and configuring my brain cannot just cannot grapple so uh, like the information is great but more so like what you said moving in the big leagues when you have somebody you trust then you can shake their hand and, and then write it down i guess you know how we understood what this mutual understood agreement is but do you have your trust? And I guess if you could speculate over a time frame with this uh, tokenomics model, with the technology yeah. we have, um, and the, and now the influx of fiat coming from a couple different sources, potentially for like retail or individual type investors, believers, contributors. Um, yeah. 
what what more will it take i can barely understand where it's come from and where like there's so many moving pieces involved but yep how 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 can how can you be sure or not sure but can you speculate on a time frame and um give me you know again i'm kind of digging for the essence of uh if you've got a confirmation inside based on what you know i'd love the information um but also to know if that that assurance lives inside of you to go okay. forward here with this next year the way the way i would be cautious in how i answer that question Please do. first of all seeds was a success it was a great success we know the idea itself is highly popular and it grabs the the imaginations of thousands of people, literally thousands and thousands of people. Um, we know that there's a big impulse toward that solution. We don't have the mechanics of it yet worked out and because it's, like you say, there's a lot of moving pieces. I mean, now we understand some of those moving pieces. How long will it take us to understand all of the moving pieces enough to make in a success, I would say ten years. Uh, I would say it would take that long. And what is and define what the what the world looks like? What the simple, if you were to explain it in an elevator speech, what you think is going to happen in ten years? Well, that's a heck of a long time, but that's actual success. You're saying so? Well, well so I look at it this way: when whenever I I used to work for Bechtel Corporation, Bechtel is the largest engineering construction company in the world. I was one of their uh, associate uh, project managers, and all we did was super large-scale projects all over the world. So I've worked in 108 countries so far, not just with them, but you know their competitors. And I learned a lot in that business. Uh, they always planned the endpoint and then worked backwards. So if this is what you're going to accomplish at X period of time, they start working backwards. And if any of those increments were not accomplishable in that 12-month segment, then there's something wrong. you got to replan it again. And you keep doing that until you have the increments, year one, two, three, four. And these were like 25-year uh, plans. And so th they were huge. Like uh, just one example is the tunnel between England and France. That was our project. We had seven contractors. It was an enormously complex undertaking. Uh, or we built the largest engineering construction project ever in the world, which was the new city of Jubail in Saudi Arabia for 250,000 people when it was just sand. I mean, we started with just sand. And everything in it, the airports, the hospitals, the stores, everything in it planned from scratch. And that was a $67 billion contract and still much larger than that now. Those are enormous human undertakings. So you can learn that humans are capable of, of really complex tasks as long as you give yourself the time to do it. And this is no different. So, yeah, in the next 12 months, we can accomplish a lot. Would I call that successfully creating the ultimate vision of seeds? No, I think that will happen in 10 years, but we will get a lot done in the next year. And we, we, we I think we'll establish this nonprofit. We will establish the ability to pay our developers. We will establish um, people who were pioneers in the seeds movement are coming back. I'll, I'll give you one example, Kiala Young. Kiala Young is a social entrepreneur. He established a 360-acre um, uh, community village project just off the Columbia River in southern Washington, uh, right near the town of White Salmon, Washington. He's one of the early pioneers of seeds. And he, he's got an on-the-ground community village that is called the Atland Collective. And he, he and I have been meeting, and he wants to come back into seeds. He, he wants to focus on face-to-face -face, uh, meetings. And uh, one of the things that I wanted to show you, by the way, 
um, is this is one of the most beautiful books I've ever seen on this subject. Which yeah, I think is, I have it right over on my shelf. <laughs> I yeah, love that book. This uh, this book is one incredible book, and talk about a book that's astute and clear and beautiful. You can see all the pages I've marked here. I haven't I haven't read everything. Uh, and one thing you'll recognize right away, and you'll recognize this. Mm -hmm. That's the artwork that's on the Seeds uh, website. When you go to Seeds, you'll see that artwork. Mm -hmm. And just about every page in this book is filled with artwork. And not only that, he honors the, the artist in the back uh, and actually gives a story about um, how that artist created the work, what the work was. And when you read this particular book, all the complexity and moving pieces are outlined in here. And there's many, many of them. Um, so I need to go back and read through it again. Yeah. So Kiela Young is the editor of this book. Even though it says here, Jamaica Stevens, uh, she calls it collaboratively authored with many voices of the village. He edited this book. And Jamaica Stevens is somebody that has the Open Futures Coalition communication platform. So what gives me the most hope is when I go around the world, I made a point of visiting seeds activists all over the world. And when you meet them, you get more and more enthusiastic. Because what you find out is not just with them, but all over the world you're finding that there are points of light popping up everywhere. It's like mushrooms popping up everywhere. They're not necessarily connected. But one that is connected that I know a lot about is the Hague Center in Holland. There, they're working with Gaia Union and helping weave together this big grant that's coming through to Gaia Union. And... Uh, Kara Stonehouse, who's a Canadian, is the liaison. So she's also part of this big picture. So when I look around and who's doing what, or, or another guy that I know and met with is Tomas Bjorkman. And he wrote a book. He's a billionaire guy that wrote a book uh, about the 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 Norwegian Scandinavian phenomenon and why are the most the happiest countries in the world up there? Why are they? Why, he wanted to understand what's the answer to that question. And he found out that they back those Scandinavian countries back in the eighteen hundreds created a back to nature movement. And they made these parks and camping areas throughout their whole country where there was enough of them that everybody could go spend time in nature. And over time, over decades, those people began to realize that nature was speaking to them. And they changed how they wanted to motivate their societies, how they wanted to motivate their cultures. And that's the key to what happened in Scandinavia. And he wrote a book about it. Uh, I have it here. Who and is that? Tomas. Bjorkman, B-J-O-R-K-M-A-N. Well, if you want, I'll get it. you want me to get the book? Sure. I'll get it. Yeah, sure. I'll get it <laughs> off the <of my> shelf. <laughs> yeah, it's great listening to you, Steve. It's, it's you know, and I, I think what you talk about with those relationships, those things that gives you hope is what has been the glue and the magnet. You know, what's brought us together and what's kept us together in a community is when you get on some seeds calls, you know, forget about any of the failures. What has been resoundingly true are the relationships that have been built and the culture that has been established and maintained. Um, yes. It, 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 and, and I hear, I agree it's like no other, but I hear from a lot of people that there isn't another cryptocurrency community or just an uh, ecologically uh, focused community that is holding it all the same way that uh, Seeds has in such an expansive, um, inclusive, equitable uh, way. That's right. 
And and this, for example, well, I'll finish this first. This is not the book I, I thought it was. Uh, I have this other book of his called uh -huh. The Market Myth by Tomas Bjorkman. It was the one before the book. But this is when he discovered that the, the capital markets and, and our capitalistic system, predatory capitalism, is leading us down the wrong road. So he wrote a book about it. There's what he looks like. That's Tomas Bjorkman right there. And he wrote in here, uh, to Stephen with love, Tomas. And he he's one of the people working in what that is known as the IDGs. Do you know about that movement? Have you heard of it? It's like the Sustainable Goals. No, the, so the SDGs, that's the Sustainable Goals of the United Nations. Right. But there's a group, of, there's a movement around the world of people that realize that we're not going to attain the Sustainable Goals until we have the inner development goals achieved, until human beings are are increasing our awareness and consciousness. So Tomas is working on a set of of activities designed specifically to enhance human awareness of this principle. Same thing that Kinship Earth is working on. And the idea is that the inner development goals are absolutely essential if humanity will embody the thinking necessary to accomplish the SDGs. It's a question of our will. And without that, we won't get there. So it's, it's like my old friend, uh, Maurice Strong. Maurice Strong was the United Nations uh, head of the Department of Environment, and he held the Rio de Janeiro Earth Summit. And he came back from that completely demoralized. He came back and said, humanity is going to hell in a handbasket based upon what I saw there. We're not ready to do what we need to do. We're just not committed. So he went to Southern Colorado and he bought up a bunch of land in the Sangre de Cristo Mountains. And he created, the nearest little town is Crestone, Colorado. And he, he offered all the major spiritual traditions of the world free land if they would go there and establish a um, major libraries of their wisdom. And anybody that would do that, they had free land from him. And they created this place. It's there. It's a wonderful place to go to. Uh, but he was so demoralized by it all, he just thought, well, at least there'll be one place on the earth when it all collapses where humanity will still have its ancient wisdom and its wisdom. It'll be preserved. And that's just an interesting story. I'm not coming from the same perspective as him. I'm, so you're not I'm, building I'm a bunker more, in the backyard with, in fully stocking no, it? No, <laughs> I am. I'm not building a bunker. I'm my my bunker is spiritual, <laughs> and uh, and and it's, it lies in in the basic human goodness of all human beings, of uh, that there is an impulse within every single human being to express their own passion in this world in a good way. And and the ones that don't are the ones that were, were growing up in circumstances that did not lead to good health, good, uh, good opportunity, and they were uh, subject to all kinds of distress and, and harm. And we, we, we have within our power to create a world that doesn't do that. And, you know, the indigenous people did it. They, they showed us the way. They've been holding that wisdom for centuries for us to finally get it. I mean, we treated them like they were the heathens and, and we were the enlightened ones. It's just the other way around. So they, they know more than we do about how the nature is speaking to us. So, yeah, I think seeds is a very, very good, unique movement there's nothing like it on the planet but it's hard it's not something for the 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 um the the dilettante who who just comes in and goes comes in and goes no this is this is something that 
requires the, the best of people. And fortunately, we have them. So whenever you meet seeds, volunteers in, in person, wow, you're so energized. It's like when I was in the Peace Corps. I went in to the Peace Corps in Brazil. And when I'm with a bunch of Peace Corps volunteers, there's nothing like it. Because they were all in service to humanity. And the seeds uh, activists are the same. They know what they're doing. They're in service to humanity. They want to make a difference in the world. So when people give money to something, I don't care what kind of philanthropist you are, you want your money to make a difference. And that's the same thing with seeds, people that dedicate their time and act and act as volunteers and seeds. They want to make sure that we're making a difference. And, and a lot of them lost hope when seeds didn't work right away the first time, although it did. It did. It was highly successful. It sputtered out for for the reasons that I cited. But already, somebody like uh, I, I always like to say that Raiki Gordon was one of the prime early movers of seeds. Basically, it was more or less his baby. He hates me to say that. He always denies it. But the fact is, that was his vision, and he he assembled the team, got people excited about it. And got it, and then he had a family and a young baby, and he had to drop out. Just fatherhood took it over. But he just announced on Discord that he's coming back in in April, in that that's time awesome. frame. He's going to find an active role again. So, so what, yeah, that's awesome. So, what's most important now? I think if we leave um, the people watching this video with something that they can hold to and something that they can hope for. What's most important now in 2024? We've been at this for a while. It might not really be what it's going to be until 10 years, but there's something to do now. There's something beautiful. There's something bountiful. And everybody listening has that something inside. And so what would you say is most important um, here in the beginning of, of the year in this season of Seeds? Well, one thing is I would suggest is to rejoin the Seeds Collaboratory and come in and attend the meetings. Those meetings are every Tuesday at 8 a.m. Pacific. And the, you can find the channels on Discord. You can get it from other people on Seeds. It's a well-known Zoom channel. It's all recorded. The meetings are recorded as well. The notes are recorded. Just come in and listen whenever you can. This, you don't have to do more than that. Just stay abreast of what's going on. Another thing that's going to happen in the near future, even if you can do nothing else, if you could put $5 a month into our 501c3 that we set up for one year, that's like $5 a month, which just about everybody can afford. For 12 months, that's $60. And then stop. That's another thing you could do. And we're, we're getting the word out. If you want to be more active than that, we are rekindling and re-energizing our, our organization. When Seeds 2.0 comes out and it's adopted, we will begin to implement that. And we will begin to implement regenerating the legacy seeds and, and starting the new seeds implementation. I don't know. I cannot predict how that's going to go. We've learned a lot of lessons. Have we learned enough lessons to make the second uh, a stage of our development more successful than the first stage? I believe so, but we won't know until we implement. But what we do know is that we're going to start at the grassroots level to build value. That's where we have to build value, not from the top down, but from the bottom up. And where we know that we've got some fairly big uh, philanthropists ready to back us in 2024. So that's the hope, and that's where we're at. And let's see if we can do it. I, I think it's doable. Yeah, it is doable.